All right, welcome to chapter two, uh, atom molecules and ions. So today we're going to look at what is responsible for the properties of different compounds or elements. And we can ask the question, why does water put out fires or why does paper burn? So if we look at the physical and chemical properties of matter, this can be explained by the structure and behavior of individual atoms. So we can think of like the English alphabet, right? There's 26 letters, but more than a million words in the English language. Well, in chemistry, we have 118 elements okay, that form all the matter of the universe. So we can take a look at the structure of these atoms to better understand how they make up the properties of matter. So for centuries, there was discussion about the existence of atoms. However, chemists began to realize that different amounts of elements could combine for new substances. Well, Dalton was the pioneer and developed his atomic theory that agreed with some of the laws of chemical conservation. And so Dalton had his theory was based on four postulates. However, Dalton's postulates actually agreed with some of the scientific laws of chemical combination that were known during his time. So these include the laws of constant composition, the laws of conservation of mass, and the law of multiple proportions, which I would encourage you to make sure you know. Now we can turn our attention more to the atom, and looking at the size and the mass of the atoms. We can describe the atom as the smallest particle of an element. Okay? And the di diameter of an atom can range from about 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10th to about 5 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. Well, chemists describe these distances in terms of angstroms. Okay? And so this is, we can use a conversion factor of one angstrom is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. So you can actually appreciate the size of the atom and the nucleus by imagining that the hydrogen atom is the size of this football field, which is the South Carolina Gamecocks football field because I'm a fan. Um, and the nucleus is just a tiny marble um, which sits at the 50-yard line. Okay? So it shows just how tiny the nucleus is, but the nucleus actually contains all the protons and neutrons and basically all the mass of, um, <coughs> of the atom. And so it's a very dense um, structure. So like I said, most of the volume of the atom is in empty space, which contains the electrons, but the nucleus contains both the protons and the neutrons. So protons and neutrons are much heavier than electrons. In fact, it would take over 1,800 electrons to equal the mass of just one proton. So since the mass of the particles are so small, and they're only like 10 to the minus 24, it's about 10 to the minus 28, um, <clears throat> which you can see over here on this table, we can convert grams to atomic mass units. Okay? And atomic mass units are just abbreviated AMUs. Well, this conversion factor is given on the slide shown here. And this conversion factor makes it easier to remember the mass of a proton or neutron since it is just one atomic mass unit. You can also note that there's charge on both a positive charge on a proton, negative charge on an electron, and neutral on a neutron. Well, we symbolize elements by either one or two letter abbreviations, and every atom has a characteristic number of protons, which we can call the atomic number. Since atoms are neutral, the number of protons and electrons must be equal. However, the number of neutrons may vary. But we can determine the number of neutrons from the mass number. Note that the mass number is equal to the total number of protons and neutrons. Atoms are represented by symbols um, from the periodic table of elements. And we usually write the mass number and or the <clears throat> atomic number as depicted. So we can write the mass number as a superscript, atomic number as a subscript, and our symbol of the element here as well. Well, we said that the number of neutrons in an atom can vary, and if the number of neutrons does vary, then the mass number will vary. These are going to be called isotopes, and in this table, we can see several different isotopes of carbon. We have carbon-11, we have carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. The number of protons and the number of electrons are constant, but the number of neutrons changes, which is going to change our mass number. For simplicity, chemists decided that the mass of an individual atom was too small. And it just made calculations too complicated. And so we said, hey, this 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 grams is just ridiculous to work with. Why don't we say that that's equal to one atomic mass unit? OK, so that's what we did. Well, most elements that we encounter in nature exist as a mixture of isotopes. An example of this is carbon, which is 99% carbon-12 and about 1% carbon-13. Well, the atomic weight is just the average atomic mass of each element in nature. Okay, So for carbon, we can actually calculate this atomic weight using this equation where we know that 
0.93% is atomic mass of 12. We can add that to what it is for carbon 13, and we find the average atomic weight um, for carbon 12. Well, <clears throat> the periodic table, okay, shown here, uh, was developed back in 1869, and it's really just our chemistry alphabet. All elements on the periodic table with their atomic number and atomic weight are shown here. Okay, so this is usually how you see it on the uh, periodic table. Well, the periodic table is divided into periods, which go um, are horizontal rows and groups that go down. Okay, and the groups are usually rows that contain elements with similar properties. Elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, and this stepwise lines step like line divides metals which are on the left side shown in like a tannish color and the non-metal shown in more of a greenish color. Well there's certain um, groups which are very important which are 1A, 2A, 6A, 7A, 8A okay and the names of these are shown here you should know these okay these groups are very important a lot of times you'll hear about the halogens and noble gases and you should know exactly what group we're talking about. So elements within a group are going to be very similar. Now, when we talk about the periodic table, we said that on the left side we have the metals. This is going to be the majority of all your elements, okay? And these are going to be very malleable. They're ductile. They're lustrous. They're good for thermal and electrical conductors. Whereas you have the non-metals shown over here in green. These are going to be on the right side of the periodic table. They're more brittle, um, dull in appearance. And then you have the metalloids, which have properties of both metals and non-metals shown in purple. All right, now we can kind of turn our attention to the molecules and molecular compounds. So most elements are found in nature in a molecular form, meaning they're composed of two or more atoms. A chemical formula describes what atoms are part of the molecule and how many atoms there are. For example, if we look at this O2, okay, it says that there's two atoms of oxygen. The diatomic molecules are molecules composed of two atoms, okay, and the common diatomic molecules include things like O2, H2, N2, F2, chlor, uh, Cl2, Br2, and I2. Okay, um, you should memorize these. You should know that these certain compound, certain elements exist in diatomic molecules. A molecular compound is a molecule composed of more than one type of atom, um, and these are much more common. So when we talk about molecular compounds, we can describe them either with a molecular formula, an empirical formula, or a structural formula. So the molecular formula is just the exact number of atoms in a molecule, whereas the empirical formula is the relative number of atoms, like a ratio. You can figure out the empirical formula if you are given the molecular formula, but not vice versa. So the last thing on this is the molecules can be described as a structural formula, which describes how the atoms um, in a molecule are joined together. And these can be in some different types of drawings. Well, now we can kind of turn to ions and ionic compounds. Okay. Ions are charged particles that are formed when an electron is either gained or lost from the atom. The result in, this results in a net charge on the atom and is represented with a superscript. Okay. We either put a plus or a minus. Um, and they are called either cations or anions. Now a cation um, has a positive charge due to the loss of an electron. These are usually on the left side of the periodic table. For example, here we can look at the sodium atom, sodium atom, atom excuse me, which can lose an electron which results in 11 positively charged protons, right, and only 10 negatively charged electrons, giving it an overall plus charge. So we have the Na plus um, cation. An anion is just the opposite, and we can see that here with the chlorine. Well, how do we predict if an atom will gain or lose an electron? Well, we turn to the chemist's best friend, right, the periodic table. So elements on the left want to lose electrons, and elements on the right would like to gain electrons. These are the common cations and anions, which you should know very well. Okay, so you should kind of know which ones are cations and which ones are anions. Well, there's actually quite a bit of cations and quite a bit of anions that you should know and memorize um, before the first exam. Um, I would suggest making flashcards of each one of these. So these are the cations. Here are the anions that you should know. The ones in bold are more common, but you should know all. So how do we form ionic compounds? An ionic compound is just formed between a metal and a non-metal. So whereas molecular compounds are actually between two non-metals. In this figure, okay, an electron from a sodium atom is transferred to a chlorine atom, right, which forms a sodium cation and a chlorine anion. These then come together and form a sodium 
uh, chloride ion called salt. Well, we can write the empirical formula for ionic compounds, um, and it's actually a very important concept. And here's some rules about how to do so. Um, and we can just look at an example where an ionic compound is formed from magnesium, so we form Mg2 plus ions, and nitrogen forms this N3 minus ion. Okay, so if we write the two um, uh, two compounds, right? We have magnesium and nitrogen. We put their uh, charge, and then we just swap those. So we could take the magnesium two plus charge that becomes the subscript on the nitrogen, and the three minus charge on nitrogen then moves over and becomes a subscript on the magnesium. And if you put those together, you get Mg3N2. The last main topic of chapter two um, is just nomenclature. It's probably one of the most important concepts. You do need to know it. Um, a lot of times I will just give you the name of a compound and you will have to know what the formula is in order to solve the problem. So you must memorize the rules. You need to know them by heart. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and just lecture about this is the basic rules of nomenclature. Um, but you should know them, okay? And you should go through these rules. They are pretty straightforward. Um, there's really two major divi divisions, organic and inorganic. Okay, of course, we're going to focus more on the inorganic, um, but a few of the organics as well. So the first little bit is just nomenclature of cations, okay? These have different rules than naming the anions. And so we first name the cation, then we can name the anion. We put those together to form an ionic compound name, okay? Um, so the nomenclature cations pretty straightforward, three simple rules. The anions get a little more complex um, and somewhat confusing when you start talking about um, some of these oxy anions, these polyatomic ions. And so I really uh, would suggest you to go through, look at the book, um, look at some stuff online in order to help really understand the nomenclature for this part. Although it is pretty straightforward if you just memorize the rules. Okay, but you should spend uh, quite a bit of time reviewing the material in the text. Okay, this is a pretty um, self-explanatory chart or table, but I really say if you kind of remember this table, that should help you name quite a bit of compound. Okay, and you'll see that when you go through these oxy anions. Um, the last step, like I said, in naming ionic compounds is just combining the name of the cation with the name of the anion, and you can form the name. So here we get calcium plus chloride, we get calcium chloride. Nomenclature of acids, this little box over here is pretty much what you need to know. You need to memorize it. It's basically a fill in the blank. Okay, You should have no problems with that if you just memorize it. The nomenclature of molecular compounds is another set of rules. It's fairly straightforward. Um, remember that molecular compounds, though, are composed of nonmetals. Okay, So if you kind of go through these first four rules, it's pretty straightforward. And if you remember these prefixes, which are pretty straightforward as well, um, you're usually not going to see much more than a hexa in this class, but you should be aware of these and they're pretty easy as well. And that's going to conclude chapter two. So um, good luck.